Hey, First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes. I want to welcome you to tonight's Wednesday Word. Hey, listen, so good to be with you this evening, and I want to thank you guys for joining, man. Christmas season is upon us, lots of hustle and bustle, but you're taking the time to stop and get into the Word of God with us, and I I just want to thank you. Um, If you're watching on Facebook, if you could hit the like button, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, if you could hit the subscribe button, that'd be a blessing to us. Comment, say hello, you got a prayer request or a testimony, we would love to hear uh, from you. Uh, We've been in a series on heroes of the faith, and uh, we've been looking at the lives of those that are listed out in Hebrews chapter 11 and seeing who they are, uh, what are their stories, uh, what is their life up to the point, and and including the things that got them kind of in the chapter of of some of the, the greats of faith, and how do we learn something from them, apply it to our lives. Because the things that we've seen, and Scripture's been pretty clear about this, is that this, without faith, it's impossible Uh, to please God. And if that is true for those who are in Hebrews chapter 11, then I think that's true for your life uh, and for mine as well. That it's going to take faith to really honor God in our lives and to please Him. And and we have to take that concept, that spiritual concept of without faith it's impossible to please God and bring it down to where you and I live every single day. I mean, if it's it's going to take faith uh, in my life tomorrow, to please God. And so I've got to be aware of that. But I also need to be aware of His presence so that I know what and where to apply that faith uh, so that I don't miss the moment or miss the opportunity. Because there really is something to live in your life with an awareness of the presence of God. Uh, You know, living uh, sensitive to His presence, uh, His Spirit each day so that I can be used by Him. Because God wants to move in you and through you. God wants to use your gifts and your talents. That's why he gave them to you. God says your life matters. And because God says your life matters, your life is going to matter because God is going to work in and through our lives. And and, and I think this is such a big thing for people in their spiritual walks. You know, like God, you know, using angels in the sky and speaking to us or bright lights or burning bushes or whatever. Uh, I know that there are people in scripture who've experienced these things because we read about them. I believe they're true. I believe they actually happened. I don't think they're fairy tales or, 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 or stretched truths. I believe these things happen and we read about them in the Word of God, but that's not always the way God speaks. Uh, sometimes God moves in a small whisper. Sometimes the Lord just drops a thought in your mind or in your heart of a person. Sometimes it's the Word of God. And I think this is the Word of God is, is the way I think God speaks to us a lot. Um, and, and it doesn't always have to be parted seas and, and thunder and lightning. And, you know, if we're thinking that that's the way God has to speak, I think there are a lot of people who will go through life not really feeling like God talks with them or speaks to them or leads them or gives them direction. And yet I think God is speaking to all of us. Uh, I think God loves you and knows you. And God has words for your life and word for your heart. And so I think each of us has the ability to hear the voice of God in our life and that we should never give that away to anybody else. Now, we're in the season of Christmas and we're celebrating the birth of Jesus as the Savior of the world. And, you know, in that day... And I'm sure wherever you go to church, if you join us, you'll hear it. If you're attending another church, you'll hear it. In that day, people were expecting a Messiah. You know, one was going to come and save them from Roman rule. And a lot of people missed it because he came in a way that they weren't expecting. And uh, I love to ask people this question. Uh, You know, what does God sound like to you? How do you know when God speaks to you? What does he sound like? Um, How does he speak to you? Um, you know, is it through scripture? Is it through worship? Is it just sensing in the Holy Spirit? You know, there, there. I have friends who kind of say every time I see a, you know, a, a, a certain bird, or every time that I, uh, you know, um, a butterfly, you know, something. It just, it's a reminder of me. I just feel like that's God's way of saying, "Hey, I'm trying to talk to you." And you know, how how do you know when you hear something that it's Him? Uh, so what does God sound like? How does He speak to you? And how do you know that it's Him? Because these are big things. If we want to be people who live by faith. If we want to be people who realize that without faith it's impossible to please God, then I need to know what he sounds like, what he's saying, and that I know that it's him. Um, you know, he's big. He's the Savior. And he's the creator, you know, of the world and all that we see. But he's also the baby in the manger that had to be changed and fed 
and cared for. So God can come however he wants to come, which is why we need to be sensitive to his presence because he'll come the way he wants to and not always the way you expect him to. Um, now, we've been working through Hebrews 11 and looking at the people who have made it to the Hall of Faith, and there was a lot of unexpected you know, in their lives. They, they all had the ability to hear from God in their moments that they were living in. And, and what you see is that, it, that, that hearing God in the moments, some moments were bigger than others, but all of them were part of leaving a legacy on the lives of an entire nation. And we st say stuff like that. You know, le their legacy impacted an entire nation. And, and that's, a, that's a big statement. That's a, that's a big statement. You kind of hear a statement like that and you go, oh yeah, that's nice. That's good. And, but I don't know if they felt that in their moments of obedience. You know, I don't know if in the moment of God speaking to Abraham or, or God talking to Sarah, if in the moment they thought, this is going to change the world. I think they just felt like there's a moment that I feel God wants me to do something. And, and responding to that, they may have felt like they were just obeying in the moment. But the thing... <clears throat> is that this simple acts of obedience can do great things in the hands of God. Uh, and all these people, you know, uh, that we look back on and say they had such great faith. I wonder if they felt that in the moment or was it them sensing his presence and taking the step of obedience? But now looking back, we see all that came from that simple step of obedience. And, and again, I think if it's true for them, it can be true for you. You and I have moments that feel like simple things that God in a moment says, will you do this? I say yes, and I step into it. But it changes, it changes the lives of other people and, and has a legacy impact that I don't really understand or fully see you know, in the moment. And, and so if it was like that for them in their moments, then our moments, your moments, my moments might not feel big, might feel like a simple yes to God or step of obedience, but could the same things come out of our obedience as the story of their lives, uh, you know, when our story is told? Uh, could someone 10, 15, 20 years from now be saying, I remember when Wes Johnson said yes to God and that thing in his life, and look what's here today because of that, you know, and I think all of our lives can have that type of legacy. That's the power of of legacy, you know, the steps of obedience in my life and what goes out from my life can have a powerful effect on the lives of others and shape people and homes and lineage. Uh, and these things that happen in the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the patriarchs of the, of the Israeli people and their nation, you know, uh, it, it impacted the entire nation, the stories of their lives that we've been looking at. So we have to be intentional about what we leave and the condition in which we leave it. So the way you live your life matters. Uh, how you handle things matters. Who you are matters. And I know that we're in the great you know, Christmas season and, and everyone wants the perfect gift. But I can tell you guys, whether it's Christmas or New Year's or, or Fourth of July, whatever day, I can tell you the greatest gift that you will ever give anybody is a physically, spiritually, and emotionally healthy you. Um, when we are right, when we are healthy, when we are with God, that is going to be one of the greatest gifts you'll ever give anyone around you. And, and so I've said this before for years, 19 years I've been here. We've got to be students of ourselves, you know, asking ourselves, how am I really doing? Uh, am, I, am I more tired than I think? Um, am I frustrated? Um, you know, how am I doing mentally? How am I doing emotionally? How am I doing spiritually? Ask yourselves in the last year, uh, you know, have I grown closer to God or have I drifted? Have I stayed living aware of his presence or have I just kind of gone into autopilot and just gotten through the day and the weeks and the months? You know, are you closer today than you were a year ago to him? Not have I gone to church more, not have I been to more groups, not have I been in more prayer meetings, not have I, have I read more devotionals. Are you closer to God today than you were a year ago? Um, are you more like Him? And, and, and we're, we're a key component of this whole thing because if you have little faith, you can pass on little faith. But if I walk with a sensitivity of the presence of God at work in my life and realize that God wants me to obey something that in my mind and my heart might feel simple and might be huge, 
that I understand that in that and through that, God has a legacy that he's establishing, you know, out of my life. And, uh, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God gives us the pattern about transferring faith uh, to others, about passing on. What God has given to us, we pass on to others. And, and I love it. It was regular contact with the Word. It was to be taught diligently. You know, the Word of God was to be part of the routine of our lives, no matter what we're doing. So there's not like the Christian box that Wes is in, and then the world box that Wes is in, and then the work box that Wes is in. But it is supposed to be I am with Christ in every box, and God is in every box. And I kind of worded it with this way. If he's the Lord of everything, involve him in everything. You know? If he's the Lord of everything in your life, involve him in everything in your life. And, and I think that's just the opposite of what the culture is right now. You know, do what you want, when you want, as often as you want, how you want to. And faith is often something that, it, that is, it, it, or faith that is, that is in certain times or certain places, I don't really think is faith at all. Um, it's either with you <clears throat> or it's not. I mean, we're people of faith or we're not. Um, I can't be kind of a person of faith. You know, you're going to believe in God and put your weight on Him uh, and trust in Him, or, or or we're not going to. You know, and if you live in a spirit, if you leave uh, a spiritual impact on the lives of, of other people, if you want to, there has to be intentionality uh, about those things. We have to intentionally impart that stuff by the way I live and the way I speak and the way I handle myself and the way that we walk out our lives. And we looked at Isaac uh, last week, who was a liar and a deceiver who had a moment with God. And he wrestled with the Lord and in that his hip was damaged uh, and he walked the rest of his life with a limp. But in that same moment, um, his heart was corrected and healed and he lived differently from that point on. And I love the fact that God just never gives up on us. Um, God just never gives up on it. He was a known liar. He was a known deceiver. And some of us, maybe early in our life, were known for different things, but God just doesn't give up on us. And so, who are you passing your faith on to? Um, God is faithful. God loves you. God has things for you. And I think God wants us not just to receive what he has for us, but to understand that we are in our lives to pass that on uh, to someone else because God is a generational God. And that's why he's described as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because those were generational moments. And the baton has been meant to be passed always to the next generation. So who are you passing the baton to? of faith and of your walk with Christ, of the calling of God, you know, on your life. And, uh, you know, we're still in the race. Uh, maybe tonight you're sitting here and you're going, man, I thank God that I've been running the race. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you used to run it and you fell on your face and kind of have wandered or drifted for a while. It's not too late. Pick up the baton, stand in the grace of God and begin to run the race again. But let's be intentional about what we do. Uh, you know, I love this. I don't have to be perfect, but I do have to be intentional. Uh, because how I live matters. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, we're given another name, and, and we know him as, as Moses. And if you've been in church for any amount of time, I'm sure you've heard the stories of Moses. And he was a great man of God. Moses did some incredible things. And, and we're going to get into those here in the next week or two. <clears throat> but in Hebrews chapter 11, I want you to see why Moses was a great man of God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 says, It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's commands. I love that. They were not afraid. I think if there is something that I could say to the day that we live in, um, it is this. There is so much fear out there. There is so much fear. And, and I love the fact that Moses' parents said, we are not going to be afraid. And so how did Moses grow up to be so great? I'll tell you, because he grew up in a home that his parents feared God more than man, and they weren't afraid. They lived faith over fear. And the same DNA in them that said, you know what, we're not going to listen to the king. We're not going to do what the world wants. We're going to honor God in this situation. That same DNA, spiritual DNA, was probably sown into the life of Moses. And so they chose to hide him so that he wouldn't be killed. And in doing so, literally saved his life. I don't mean like hypothetically. I don't mean like, oh my gosh, you scared me to death. I mean like he was going to die, but by doing this, Moses lived. 
I mean practical life and death stuff. And when he got too old to hide, they came up with a plan to position him in a safe and secure place. And what they did, and many of you know the story, they put him in a basket, they put him out in the Nile River close to the place where the Pharaoh's daughter would come down and she would bathe and they thought she's going to find him, her maternal instincts are going to kick in. And you know what? They were right. They came up with a plan, and the plan worked. Exodus 2, verse 6, as she opened it and saw the baby, he was crying, and she felt sorry for him. She felt compassion for him. This is one of the Hebrews' babies, she said. Now, what they also did was they positioned Moses' sister, Miriam, at a distance to see what happened when Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe because they knew she couldn't take care of the child herself. And so when Moses was found, Miriam all of a sudden shows up, presents herself, and says, listen, do you want me to go find someone to take care of this child for you? And, and the Pharaoh's daughter said, absolutely do it. She agreed. And so she went and got Moses' mother, who was able to take Moses, feed him, raise him, uh, uh, love him, be a mom to him, and, and got paid to do it. And in Exodus 2, 5-10, it says this, Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. See, listen, we will never discover what God can do until we trust him to do it. You just never know what God can do. We've got to have faith. We've got to apply it practically in our life and trust the Lord. Now, Moses' parents decided that they weren't going to be controlled by the culture because the culture was those children were to be killed, but rather they were going to trust the one true God. All right, now living by faith means choosing God's plan over the culture's plan and then watching him work it out for your good and the benefit of others. And you see... God at work in this. You see the impact of Moses' mother on his life. Hebrews 11, 24 and 25 says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And yeah, he, he grew up in the palace. And even though he was in the culture of the palace, his mom shaped Moses' worldview in the time that she had with him. She instilled in him a heart for his people and a foundation of his true identity. The world is always trying to give you an identity, but she made sure Moses in his heart understood who he was and, and whose he was. And you see the impact of that on him as an adult. He had faith in what his mother had taught him, which ultimately transferred him into faith in the one true God. It shaped his choices, it shaped his values, and it shaped his life. Now, I need you to understand this. Is by this time, Moses in his life, he's 40 years old, Moses was set. He's in the king's palace. He had everything you could dream of. He had power. He had money. He had position. He had education. He had it all. He had it made. But scripture says he chose to no longer be associated with the Egyptians. And I'm telling you, it was the influence of his mother that showed him that he had other options. Guys, what if the calling on all of our lives is to tell people who are still in darkness that they have other options? You don't have to live like the world. You don't have to think like the world. You don't have to respond like the world. There is a different way, and we believe a better way. So I wonder how many people live in darkness simply because they don't know they have an option. Do you remember the time and the freedom that you felt when you realized that I don't have to live like the world? You know the freedom and, and that feeling of, of the shackles coming off when you realize I don't have to do what they do and act like they act and, and engage my life into those things because I know how I felt. And I, there's a different way. There's a better way. She had taught Moses that he had been spared for a reason and a purpose. And when you understand that, that your life has a reason and a purpose, uh, that, that it helps you fight the currents that try to pull you in and pull you along. You know, Hebrews 11.26 says, He thought it better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. His focus determined his future and the future of the people of Israel. 
Because of the influence of his life, you know, and, and his mom, Moses knew more about who he was and that God had a plan for her life than he would have had her voice not been in his life. The way you live matters. The way we speak matters. The way we influence people matters. Uh, and there's another reason he chose not to be identified with the Egyptians. Acts chapter 7, 23 to 25 says, One day when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, the people of Israel. He saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite, so Moses came to the man's defense and avenged him, killing the Egyptian. And Moses assumed that his fellow Egyptians would realize that God had sent him to rescue them. But they didn't. You know, Moses at this time is 40 years old. And while God wanted to use him, <coughs> whew, I ain't got the COVID. I'm good. While God wanted to use him to deliver his people, it wasn't this way. Moses made some mistakes. He kind of jumped ahead of some things. But he eventually, and I love that word, because I think sometimes in our lives, the word eventually is such a big deal. Yeah, I missed it in the beginning. I didn't get it right here. But eventually, eventually, uh, I ended up, he ended up where God wanted him to be. And he answered the call in God's timing and in God's way to lead the people of Israel to freedom. And, and the thing I will say about Moses is, is this, that when he rose up and killed the Egyptian, it was not the brightest idea. Uh, it was not. He was willing, though. He was willing, though. Again, I'm not saying that was the right thing. It was the wrong thing. It was a wrong thing, it was a wrong time, it was a wrong way. But I will say this, I got a squirrel attacking me. He was willing to make a decision and he was willing to live with the consequences. Uh, and once you in your heart decide to stand with God and live a life of faith, there are going to be consequences. Uh, I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't like situations where people say, oh, if you turn to Jesus, everything is, you know, butterflies and rose gardens. And, and that's not true. Uh, there are times you lose friends. There are times that, that you'll miss opportunities that are world opportunities that, that are not God opportunities in your life. There are consequences. There are things that come with that. Faith is not a popularity contest. And, and often things of the world are going to be in direct competition or conflict to the things of God for your life. And so there is a price to that. But in Hebrews 11, it says he chose to be mistreated along with God's people rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And I love this because he said, yes, yeah, sin can be fun. Uh, people that tell you sin's not fun probably never sinned. Um, sin can be fun, but it is at best fleeting. It is at best temporary. And what you find with sin is that to stay at the level of fun, you not only have to continue to do it, but you often have to do it more to maintain the same feel. Uh, and, and the thing with sin, it just never stays in the box you put it in, and it spreads, and it always takes you further than you want to go. I mean, you often have to up the dose to have the same impact. And so Moses says, rather than, than get caught up in the fleeting pleasures of sin, I'm going to invest my life and give my life to the long-term gain. And uh, I love that. You know, I'm a saver by nature. And, and I love, he's just saying, yeah, 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 there's going to be a cost here. But in the long run, I'm going to be better doing God's thing and doing it God's way. He weighs the cost. He weighs the pros and cons. And it says he disregarded for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead for his reward. Moses, Moses chose a side. He understood what truly mattered, and he settled his heart on it. And, and it wasn't by himself. It wasn't Moses did it all alone. He was told the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by his mom. He was told the prophecies of the promised land flowing with milk and honey. And you know what? We tell our friends and we tell our children, don't settle for the junk of Egypt and miss out on the reward of God. Uh, it says in Hebrews eleven twenty seven, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. He in his life chose God's presence over the earthly king's presence. He jumped out there. He killed an Egyptian again. Not good. He hadn't developed any relationship with Israel. Uh, with Israel, it was a very poor decision. I would never encourage anybody to do that. But his heart was he tried to save a Hebrew the wrong way, and it cost him, and he had to run for his life. But even so, God knew his heart, and, and to help was right. 
God didn't remove the consequences of his actions because everything has a price. We do have to do things God's way and God's timing. Acts 7, 25 to 30 says this. Moses assumed his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them, but they didn't. The next day he visited them again. He saw two men of Israel fighting. He tried to be a peacemaker. Men, he said, you are brothers. Why are you fighting each other? But the man in the wrong pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? He asked, are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Ooh, bum, bum, ba. Then Moses heard that, or when Moses heard that, he fled the country and lived as a foreigner in the land of Midian. There his two sons were born. And 40 years later, in the desert near Mount Sinai, an angel appeared to Moses in the flame of a burning bush. I love this. This poor reaction, this poor handling of a situation when he was 40 years old led him to a 40-year detour in his life. He went from position of power, position to God, brought him all the way to the backside of a desert. But there were a lot of things God shaped in Moses, God taught Moses, that Moses had to learn out in the wilderness. You've got to understand something. Even in the detours of our life, when we've missed a moment or mishandled something, and we look back now and go, gosh, I wish I had another opportunity at that. You've got to understand, God wastes nothing. And I love this. One day Moses is walking and he sees in the distance a bush burning, but it's not burning up. And it catches his eye and catches his heart. And he approaches it and God calls to him from the bush and says, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Exodus 3, 7 to 10 says this. And the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go. For I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. This is the calling of Moses. And we see that Moses has grown. And he's not perfect. And he makes mistakes in the journey. He does. And so do we. But he's learning to trust God. And he's learning to trust the timing of God. And, and I think we can all understand Moses some. We look back at our own lives and see some poor choices. We can look back at our own lives and wish we could have a mulligan or a do-over. You know, I look back at my life and say, man, if I had made this decision there, this wouldn't have happened and I could have done this. You know, it, it's, it's, I get Moses. I understand Moses because in some ways I am. I am a Moses. But I also want you to see, and I'm closing with this, the faithfulness of God and his grace. He redeemed Moses. And God will redeem you. In this Christmas season, um, I don't have to live my life looking back and saying I could have been, I should have been. But I can receive the grace of God in my life right now, today. And walk in faith, because without faith it's impossible to please Him. And say, God, my life is yours. My heart, my home, all I have is yours. You're the Lord of everything, and I want you involved in everything. And God can use you to change somebody's world. I believe that. I believe that. First Assembly, I love you. I love you, man. I wish you have a great Christmas season, and, and I hope you get all the gifts you want. Everything's the right size, but more than anything, I just pray for a uh, just an overwhelming presence of the Holy One to be on you and in you and in your home. You are valuable. You are redeemed, uh, and you are His child, and I love that. I love that. A couple things. This coming Friday, 6 o'clock, Christmas Eve service. We're going to meet in person and online. Sunday at 1030, we're going to be having service on the 26th. Uh, and also coming up in January 3rd to the 23rd, we're going to be doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. And there are going to be a lot of prayer opportunities. There's going to be Zoom uh, meetings in the evenings where we're going to come on and no set time. Might be a few minutes, might be longer. And just pray uh, together as a body corporately. And, uh, and in the past, we've always done a Daniel fast. But what we're doing differently this year is I want to encourage you 
to pray to the Lord as to what kind of fast He would like you to do. Uh, maybe you're going to fast social media. Maybe you're going to do a three-day fast. Maybe you're going to do an Esther fast or Daniel fast. And we'll have some information on different types of fasts uh, that go out for you to kind of look and, and, and pray over. But I want to encourage you to fast in this season, but also really commit to times of prayer corporately together with us. And you'll have that information coming out soon. Uh, but also mark your calendar on January the 19th. Uh, we're going to be shutting, it's a Wednesday night, we're going to be shutting everything down, all the Bible studies and small groups, and come together for a night of prayer and praise in the sanctuary, and I would love for you to come and be a part of that. First Assembly, I love you, and I bless you, and I pray that you have a great week. More than anything, tell somebody about Jesus.